we are live. So welcome everyone uh, to this afternoon's edition of Stories for Healing. Uh, we're bringing our first week to a conclusion here, which is really pretty amazing. Uh, we have um, over 1,100 views of these stories on Facebook and over 200 on YouTube, the channel of uh, these stories. Um, and this is our attempt really as storytellers to try and do something about this very divisive world that we seem to be finding ourselves in. And you know, those of us in the United States think it's somehow unique to us, but it really isn't. This is a challenge that I think we're facing around the world. And rather than tell people you're good or you're bad or you should do this or don't do that, um, what we really need to do is start to heal. And as storytellers, for us, the best way to do that is to tell stories of healing. Um, and so that's what we do twice a day. This uh, afternoon, we're very pleased to be able to welcome Rona Barbour, who's a, a storyteller from across the pond. And uh, she will have a story for us today. So uh, Rona, please tell us a story. Thank you, Jim. Well, as Jim's just told you, my name is Rona Barber and I'm a lifelong storyteller. And I believe that storytelling is one of the most powerful mediums we've ever had the good pleasure to use. I was brought up in a family of storytellers and I had a story told to me every single night and that was a blessing. So I'd like to share one of those blessings with you now. If you asked anybody now what they would feel if they had to go to a hospital at this moment in time, they would be absolutely horrified. They would be afraid, they would be frightened because of the COVID-19 situation. But this happened long before COVID-19 and it wasn't the hospital that people didn't want to go into. It was just one particular ward because Duncan was in that ward. And Duncan was the worst patient that anybody could ever remember having had to be attended to in that hospital. He was rude, he was obnoxious, he was angry the whole time. He was obviously in pain, but that didn't allow for his behaviours, which were absolutely dreadful. And the other patients slowly, one by one, just went silent until at one point you could have heard a pin drop in that ward when he was not ranting and raving and bullying all the other patients and the nurses. I mean, it was unbelievable. He was but you know bullying these fantastic young women who were looking after him and healing him. Did he appreciate it? No. And then one day, Gordon was wheeled into the ward. Gordon was a man of similar age. They were both in their 60s. And Gordon was also quite ill. And he put up with this for two whole days and then thought, I've had enough of this. So he called over to him. Duncan, is it? Is it Duncan? And Duncan responded with, yeah, but what's it to you? What do you need to know my name for? And Gordon said, well, I just like to be able to know who I'm speaking to. It's just polite to say, hi, Duncan, listen to this. He says, and I wanted to share something with you. Share something with me. But what have you got? You got biscuits or sweets or something? What are you talking about? He said, no, no, I just wanted to tell you something. Tell me something. Oh, no, no, I don't want to know. Oh, well, I just thought he might be interested. I'm going to tell you anyway, because this is really to share with everybody in the world. I want to share this. I want to share what I can see now, what I'm looking at. What are you looking at? Because Gordon's was the only bed that had a window close by. And out of that window, he was looking at that point and describing everything that he could see. And he said to Duncan, you know that this hospital sits on that very busy main road and that huge hedge on the other side of the road. I bet you very few people, unless the people living on the other side, know what's there. 
I says, but I've just discovered there's a park there and it looks incredible. There's gardens and there's a pond and there's, it looks probably like ducks on the pond. It wouldn't be swans because they're not white. I said, it's fascinating. And there's a group of young women there running about with their babies and their buggies. I know what that is because my granddaughter does it. It's called buggy fit. And that's them having their exercises with their babies and their prams. Quite fascinating, really, watching them. I said, you know, it's just incredible that I've never known that was there. He said, and guess what? See what else I can see? Oh, I don't know if I like this. He said, you know what's in the car park at the bottom here? A red Ferrari. Who in this hospital could afford to have a red Ferrari? I hope it's no the purser and all the money's going on that instead of to the boss. And they gave a little giggle at that point. And so he carried on telling them all the things that he could see that were going on outside. And then he started to talk about other things, things that went on in his life and things that he remembered. If he saw something in the park that he wanted to share with them, a kid on one of these little um, metal go-cars, I remember I had one of them. And then he would tell them the story about it. And so it went on. And he told these stories until one by one, everybody fell silent again, but for a different reason entirely. And including Duncan. The place was so quiet and so serene. But there was a different atmosphere now. And Nurse Helen, the bossy one, but everybody's favourite, as she was walking past Gordon's bed one day, she leant over and kissed his feet through the sheets. And he giggled and he said, what was that for? She said, you. That's for you. You're a blessing. And he said, what? She said, listen. He said, I can't hear anything. She said, listen. He says, I can't hear anything. She says, exactly. That was you. All that ranting and raving from that man has stopped because you have transformed him with those stories that you tell him. And then, a few days later, sadly, Gordon left that ward and went to the recovery ward. And I would love to tell you that that continued the serenity and the peace and the quiet. So I'm happy to be able to say that it did. Because the next thing that happened was Duncan called on Helen uh, nurse Helen, um, do you think I could get my bed shifted over to the window? Uh, and she said, yeah, well, I suppose so, but why? Well, I want to do what Gordon did. I want to look outside and see everything and tell the people in the ward what's there. And by this time, other wards had transformed, not that they needed to transform in the same way, but what was happening was that the nurses were going into the other wards and telling the patients the stories there. And he knew this. And he wanted this little bit of notoriety being the storyteller. So she said, well, I don't see why not. I'll get the porter. But when the porter came up to the ward, he stood in the corner and had a little huddle, talking, whispering. And he was saying, oh, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. And she's saying, just do it, please. So they moved Duncan's bed over to the window. And he sat up and he tried to see what Gordon had seen. And he let out the biggest mouthful of expletives you've ever heard. He was absolutely furious. What was all that about? High hedges and gardens and ponds and buggy fit? Ferraris? There's nothing there. There's a blank wall outside this window. Why would somebody do that? That's really cruel. And Helen says, but is it? Is it cruel? He says, well, 
She says, look what it's done. Look what it's done for you. Look what it's done for the other patients in this ward. Look what it's done for us. I think it's wonderful what Gordon did. And Duncan looked at her and he said, do you think I could do that? And she said, well, I don't see why not. He says, but I wouldn't know what to say. I mean, where did he get all that stuff from? She said, it's imagination. I don't know if I could do that. She says, well, why don't you give it a try? Why don't you start with the red Ferrari? You've never had a red Ferrari, have you? He says, don't be ridiculous, of course not. She says, would you like one? He says, I don't even know if I would. He says, well, why don't you start talking about that? Why don't you ask the other patients what kind of cars they've got? Well, that's a good idea, he says. But I really liked the idea of all that stuff that was going on outside. I can't believe he did that. I can't believe he was able to do it. But I'm going to give it a try. And you know what? He did. The transformation continued because Duncan was in there for probably longer than he needed to be. I'm sure they had to drag him out of the place eventually. But if it proved nothing else, it proved that storytelling is indeed a great healer. But the story doesn't end there because when the porter spoke to Helen again, he said to her, how? Did that go with moving Duncan to the window and, and him seeing that there was nothing out there but a blank wall? And she said, well, he wasn't too happy at first. He felt as if he'd been robbed or something. And the porter said, but did you tell him? Did you tell him that Gordon was blind? Hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rona. What a beautiful story. As, as you tell that story, Rona, who are the heroes in that story? Um, the heroes are, believe it or not, uh, Duncan becomes a hero, but he doesn't mm -hmm. start off as a hero. But no. he's probably my favorite hero because it's a very difficult thing to make a transformation like that. Mm -hmm. But um, the patients are heroes of a sort because they could have all rebelled, I suppose, <laughs> and had them chopped out of the ward. Um, but I think when people are ill, they are less resilient sometimes, especially if they're very ill. So, and Gordon, of course, was a hero. For me, he was a hero because he knew exactly what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And that reminded me of my father because he knew what he was doing. When he was telling us stories, he wasn't just telling us stories. He was teaching us values, principles, morals, mm -hmm. fed through those stories. And of course, you don't know that at the time. You're just enjoying the adventure as it's going on. <laughs> but sure, sure. Later on, when these things matter, you think, oh, I remember such a thing, or I remember this. So yeah, I think, um, and of course, the nurses um, are heroes yeah. without saying, it goes without saying that they are heroes anyway, especially now today in this time. Um, I've had cause to go to the hospital myself quite recently, was not looking forward to it one bit um, because everybody has the same fear, I think. You go in there and there's COVID in there, are you going to come back out again? Yes. <laughs> in head first and out feet first? <laughs> but, yeah, it is, it is um, a worry. But I like that story because it's got a few different messages, but I think the one that comes across is just how powerful storytelling is. Yeah, yeah. When, healing, yeah. when it comes to healing. And and I would I agree with all of that and just add to it how powerful listening is. Um, and and you know um, how much that really matters. How we how the nurse learned to listen, um, in a sense, and helped and helped uh, each of them listen. All of them listen. So thank you. Okay, folks. Well, here we have yet another edition of Stories for Healing. Uh, there will be another 
telling tonight at eight o'clock Eastern time. And I want to invite all of you to, uh, to do a few things. One is to come back and spread the word, to visit our YouTube channel and to hear the stories there that you haven't heard or the ones you've heard and listen to them again. And to, uh, and to start to tell stories yourselves, really uh, look to the others in our world as people who can, can be healed. And you know what? It's not that you'll be healing them, but you'll be healing yourself. And that's really what it takes. So again, uh, thank you for visiting and we will see you in just a few hours. Good night.